Thank you for joining us for the virtual continuation of Bridge Builders, Conversations with Interesting People, presented by the Clinton Foundation and sponsored by Colson Oil. My name is Kevin Thurm and I'm the CEO of the Clinton Foundation. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Ellen Ochoa, the first Latina to ever go into space. Her extraordinary bio is full of accomplishments, accolades, and awards. And believe it or not, you're about to hear the abridged version. Dr. Ochoa has logged almost 1,000 hours during four different trips into space. Prior to her career as an astronaut, Dr. Ochoa was a research engineer and she holds three patents for optical systems. Dr. Ochoa served as the director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas from 2013 until her retirement in 2018. She currently serves on several boards. She's the chair of the National Science Board and a director for Service Corporation International, Mutual of America, and the Gordon and Betty, for Betty Moore Foundation. Dr. Ochoa has six schools named for her and has been inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame, California Hall of Fame, and the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. We are deeply honored to host this conversation with you tonight. And now, I am pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, a longtime friend and fellow alum from the Clinton administration, Maria Echevesti. Maria served through all eight years of the Clinton administration. During the first term, she led the wage and hour division at the Department of Labor. And during the second term, she served as director of the Office of Public Liaison, and then as assistant to the president and Deputy Chief of Staff for President Clinton from 1998 to 2001. She is currently President and CEO of the Opportunity Institute, a research-oriented non-for-profit focused on education policy and economic mobility. Now, allow me to hand the program over to two members of Stanford University's Hall of Fame, Maria Cheveste and Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Thank you, Kevin, for um, those warm words. And, and really, I'm so honored to have a chance to, to see old friends, but, but particularly to be able to have a conversation with Dr. Ellen Ochoa, who truly uh, has marked, made tremendous strides, and just is such a role model that uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun in this conversation. Um, so I want to start and welcome you. And um, I just want to get into it because uh, I'm just dying to know, as someone, as I mentioned earlier, who actually wanted to be an astronaut, you actually did it. So what, <laughs> what, what drew you to study science first and pursue a career in science? And then I want to hear all about um, that choice to go to be an astronaut selection and training. So let's start with the science. What drew you? Okay. Well... Uh, first of all, I can say I never thought when I was young that was something I grew up to do. You know, I was 11 when the Apollo astronauts landed on the moon. Of course, I was watching, everybody was watching, the whole world was watching, and it was fascinating. But there weren't any women astronauts, there weren't any minority astronauts, it, and it just never occurred to me at that point that was something someone like me could grow up and do. And unfortunately, I didn't know any scientists or engineers. So in high school, I really didn't even take advantage of the science classes offered. I took biology, but I should have taken chemistry and physics and, and didn't. Um, the, what kind of saved me is that I did take a lot of math classes. I had always done well in math and I liked them. And so in high school, I took the uh, first semester of what would be college calculus. And uh, when I went on to college and I, I went to our local university, San Diego State University, um, lived at home. Uh, at that time, I know this is hard to believe now, but it didn't have tuition um, and the fees that it did have, I was able to cover with a small scholarship from the school. So I was able to go to college um, quite inexpensively. Um, but wasn't really sure what I wanted to uh, major in. And so I just tried a lot of different things. Um, but I did decide to finish up the calculus series uh, in, uh, in college. And when I was kind of getting to the end of that, I was asking other students in the class what they were studying. 
because I really still hadn't decided on a major and I was near the end of my second year of college by then. And of course it was mainly engineering and physics. And so I thought, you know, I really don't know anything about those fields. Maybe I should go talk to some professors. So I had an, uh, a couple of encounters. Um, some of this may sound a little bit familiar uh, to you, but I, I talked to a professor in the electrical engineering department and he was like, well, you know, we had a woman come through here once, but you know, it's a really difficult course of study. Mm -hmm. And um, it was quite clear he was not at all interested in having me in the department. And he didn't give me any information <laughs> about engineering, which is, you know, what I really went to him for. Um, fortunately, I got quite a different reception uh, when I went to talk to a physics professor. And first of all, he said he was glad to hear I was interested in physics. He told me about some careers people could have if they studied physics, which to me was really important because I really had no idea. You know, I, I just couldn't picture it. And so he was really the first one to kind of talk me through that. And then he, he asked me, well, tell me a little bit about your math background. So I told him, well, I'm, you know, I'm finishing up the calculus series and, you know, I have the top grade in the class. And he's like, well, I think you'll do great if you study physics then because you've already learned the language of physics and you can just really focus on the concepts, whereas most people in the classes will be studying them concurrently. So, um, so I, I tried it out the next semester and, and ended up, you know, changing my major and, and majoring in physics. But I sometimes think um, how different my life would have been, uh, you know, if I either hadn't had that second conversation <laughs> Um, or, you know, had just talked myself into doing something different. I, and I think, um, you know, it's sad, but it, it's worth underscoring that your experience in, with that first professor in engineering of, of really no, no encouragement <laughs> is um, sadly perhaps less, but still very much prevalent on many of our college campuses and um yes. and sometimes thinking about that almost serendipitous conversation that can lead you to a path in this case it led you to physics and i i dare say there probably weren't that many latinas in your physics classes oh uh, as far as i know none and uh, really hardly any other women. I think there was um, one or two other women in the same class I was uh, in physics at um, San Diego I think, State. I wonder, in some ways, did that help you in navigating when you decided to apply to become an astronaut, which again would not necessarily be a very uh, welcoming place for women? Tell us about that. A, making the decision to apply, yeah, and then right. just selection and training. Yeah, I'll talk through a, a couple of more steps. So um, uh, I had a couple of summer jobs uh, working in research labs when I was an undergrad. And then I also needed to do a senior research project myself as a physics major. And that's what got me interested in pursuing research, which really requires an advanced degree. So that's what uh, propelled me into graduate school. And then near the end of the first year of graduate school is when the space shuttle flew for the very first time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can remember this, Maria, but it was a very different kind of spacecraft than it had ever flown before. And it was capable of so much more than just taking people to and from space. You know, you could deploy satellites, you could capture them, you could repair them, you could build things in space. And primarily it was going to be used as a laboratory while it was up. So the idea was to do a whole variety of different kinds of science and engineering research. Well, here I was on this path to, um, to go into research as an engineer myself. And so it was that confluence of, you know, getting to be involved in space exploration and doing research in a unique laboratory where you could do experiments that you could not do anywhere on Earth that, that really got me interested. And then a couple years later, after that first flight, um, as I was now in the middle of my PhD program, Sally Ride flew. And, um, uh, you know, obviously a huge deal, first American woman in space. And, you know, not only was she a woman, but she'd been a physics major like me. She'd gone to Stanford, like both you and I. And, um, you know, I think I really needed to see all those connections 
before I could even conceive of the idea like, well, maybe this is something that I, you know, I can go off and do. So it took me a little while longer, but I decided I would apply to NASA as soon as I finished up my PhD, uh, which is exactly what I did, but I didn't really expect to hear back from them. I mean, I know thousands of people apply and they only select astronauts every three or four years, five years, you know, it just depends on, on when they need some. Um, so I went off to work as a research engineer. A um, couple years later, I got the chance to interview and got to talk to astronauts one-on-one -on -one really for the first time, visit Johnson Space Center. I wasn't selected that year, but I was encouraged to keep my application current. And, um, and I also realized I really needed some operational experience because I mainly worked in a lab. I wrote research papers, talked at conferences, um, but you also need to um, do, have other kinds of skills as an astronaut. So I did, uh, for example, go, go off and get a pilot's license. Um, also moved to a NASA research center because I wanted to work for NASA no matter what. Three years later, uh, I got to interview again and I was selected. And I will say, um, women had been in the core by that time for 12 years. So they certainly helped <laughs> you know, break that barrier. And the core at that time was about 20% women. And I just remember thinking that was a much higher percentage of women than I had seen in at least 10 years, you know, all through my um, studies and, and my earlier jobs. So actually, you know, it, it, it seemed <laughs> like there was a lot more women than I was used to. Yeah, no, and I, it, it's not quite that, but I know when I went to law school, um, and I'm dating myself here because I'm <laughs> class of 1980, but um, there were much fewer women in law school uh, at that time. And now, of course, we've got 50% or more of women in law schools, in yes. college. And you know, so there's definitely something that has changed there. But the pilot's license, now that. Is that required? I mean, there must be people who don't. What made you do that? Because that's also a, um, an exciting skill to have, to be able to. Yeah. Well, no, it's not required, but it turns out that most astronauts do have piloting experience. And of course, there's a certain number who are selected as pilot astronauts, and they generally have had careers as military uh, test pilots, for example. But like I said, what I lacked was any kind of really operational experience where you have to take in a lot of information, you have to make decisions, decisions that could be life or death. And um, uh, a pilot, being a pilot of, of an aircraft certainly fits in that category. And, and the skills are very transferable to actually flying in the space shuttle. But other people have uh, done things like scuba divers or mountain climbers, or they've uh, spent time in Antarctica, maybe even wintered over. Um, but they've had something in their background that said, you know, I can, I can work well in an environment like that. Hmm. Well, you know, I think for some of us, our only experience with the space program is what we've seen in the movies, right? And, and what, you know, what is shown by NASA when we, during the shuttle program. But the training aspect, I mean, pre preparing for zero gravity or for, you know, intense um, G experience, like how did you prepare for that? <laughs> yeah, you know, the training was really, really interesting and I loved it. And there were, I would say there's kind of two classes of training and one of it is um, more like being in school, right? So. You get this stack of workbooks and you've got to read through them and show that you understand the material. Um, and, you know, I spent 10 years in college. I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> you know, I know how to study and, and learn new material. But then there was this whole other aspect where we needed to learn how to fly in high performance aircraft. And we had to get a, a scuba license because um, some of the training for spacewalks is done underwater. And, um, and we had to do some survival training because if you do fly in high performance aircraft or even in an emergency in the shuttle, there's always the possibility that you actually have to punch out and um, you know, deploy a parachute and land either on land or in water. 
So uh, we did some of that as well. And that was all new to me. I mean, I used to tell people uh, I wasn't even a Girl Scout. So <laughs> I, had, I had really no background in that at all. But, you know, I really found like the other members of my class were really helpful and, and encouraging. And some of the ones for which this was very routine and old hat, um, you know, would give me tips and, and the trainers that we had for some of those activities, the trainers were generally in the military. We went to military bases. Um, you know, they, they were used to training people who had not had experience prior. And so, you know, it was just getting through it one step at a time. Sometimes I would wonder like, wow, am I just gonna, you know, how am I gonna respond to this? But, you know, it's, a, it's just like anything else. You take it step by step. So exciting. But, but what, it, what it, your answer reveals, it's tremendous amount of hard work, hard work to get to that point where you can actually um, board a ship, board a rocket and be able to go out in space. So, so I want to turn to that because you've traveled into space four times. You've got um, you know, more than a thousand hours in space. Um, so I'm gonna ask some quick questions just to get a sense of, okay, that's, that's a lot of time. Um, what did you study when you were in orbit? Specific sort of research projects Right. Um, so on my first two flights, um, we flew the same instruments. They were part of a program NASA had at that time called Mission to Planet Earth, where we were studying the Earth itself. And we were particularly studying the Earth's atmosphere and the problem of ozone hole and ozone depletion. So we had a suite of instruments in the payload bay that were continuously taking data the whole time that we were up there. So kind of exactly like what got me interested in the first place, being able to do experiments that we could not do on earth and learn new things. And I remember talking to one of the um, principal investigators for one of the instruments when I got back, one of the scientists, and I said, you know, how could we as astronauts help, help even more in terms of you collecting data? And he said, well, stay in space longer. Well, NASA at that time was uh, planning for a space station. And so my third and fourth flights we're part of building the International Space mm. Station. That's terrific. I mean, uh, we hear so much about the space station and there's just something, uh, at least I find very, the fact that there, there's a place where countries are actually collaborating on, and working together and something that really depends on people working together, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, while you were in orbit, what did you do in your off hours to relax? Well, I will say on a space shuttle mission, there's uh, very little free time because, you know, you're only in space, say, around 10 days or so. And of course, uh, trying to accomplish as much as you can during that time. So, uh, you know, there isn't a lot of relaxation time. For astronauts on the space station today, they're also very busy, but they're up there six months at a time. And so they do get, you know, Sundays or are most often sort of more of a day off and you, you have a little more time like that. But any free time that we did have, we were generally looking out the window. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, that's just, uh, you're always drawn um, to the view outside the window. If you're on the daylight side of the earth, you know, you're looking down at, you know, oceans and landforms and cities and uh, mountain ranges. And, you know, there's just so much to see. And if you're on the, the night side, um, obviously cities are very visible at night uh, because of the lights. You can see amazing thunderstorms at night. And, and then if you look um, in a different direction, of course, you get an amazing view of the stars. There, there are so many more visible when you're above mm -hmm. the Earth's atmosphere. And then I guess one other thing I'll mention, today on the space station, um, there are several musical instruments on board. So people who are musicians, that is one of the things they enjoy doing. And I, on my space shuttle mission, as I mentioned, there really wasn't much free time. But on my first flight, I did get to take my flute into space. Um, we were shooting a video for kindergartners through second graders to kind of compare and contrast living and working in space with their everyday lives on Earth. So we did try to talk a little bit about what hobbies you might do in space. And so I got to play my flute for a few minutes. Well, actually, that's a perfect segue to um, 
something maybe our audience um, doesn't know, which is what 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 about what is something about life and space that we that would surprise us? I mean, so much of it is, but something that stands out to you that um, people here on Earth would would just have no idea. <laughs> Well, um, I don't know. There's a lot of ways I could go with that, but I will mention one thing um, on the International Space Station. Obviously, you're trying to be as self-contained as possible, right? I mean, we do send up cargo missions, and of course, we send up fuel and, and um, oxygen and water, but you'd like to minimize how, many, how much of the consumables that you bring up. So we do have a system on the space station that recycles water. And, and pulls moisture out of the air, recycles water. And of course, what that means is recycle your urine as well. And uh, so the astronauts refer to that as uh, turning yesterday's coffee into today's coffee. Um, and <laughs> so, um, but it's a very good system and so it works quite well. I think they're able to recycle somewhere between 85 to 90% um, of the water and if you're thinking about uh, in the future a mission to Mars, they want to get it above 95%. Well, I actually think that those kind of experiments and that kind of knowledge is actually going to be hugely relevant to people on Earth, given um, I do a lot of work on food and agriculture and water systems. And um, I live in California where we have periodic droughts. And so this question of recycling um, and treating wastewater um, has become more and more important um, as our population increases and we face shortages of water and then also shortages of food. So um, 85 to 90% is pretty dang yeah. good. And uh, in fact, some of the technology that helps um, purify that water so it can be recycled is actually being used on Earth. In fact, there's some rural areas in Mexico where the technology is being applied. So, you know, kind of one of the mottos of the space station is off the earth for the earth, because almost everything that we do is actually applied in some way back here on earth. And if I remember correctly, wasn't Velcro something that was early, or is that just a myth about? We, we use a lot of Velcro, but NASA wasn't the one that actually developed it. But sometimes I think there's no way we could have done our jobs without it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad we clarified that. It's one of those myths. Um, when we have a question um, from someone in our audience um, who's seven, Bella, who asks, okay. what was the most amazing thing you saw in space? Well, that's another hard one to answer too, right? Because I mean, you're sort of bombarded with um, all these amazing views. Um, but I think the thing that to me was the most kind of sci-fi looking thing <laughs> um, was the auroras that we saw from space. So, you know, these are beautiful displays of light um, and uh, they really, um, you, you get these green and red uh, lights above the surface of the earth, closer to both the North and the South Pole at certain times. Um, cars by particles that are emitted from the sun that interact with gas in our atmosphere and in particularly oxygen. I might actually be able to pull up a picture behind me. So that's kind of what it looks like from space. You, you can see these green filaments of light and then um, reaching up into space and you see the sort of the red tips and of course, it's constantly moving. So it's sort of like this, this ghost-like, um, constantly moving stream of light. And I, will, I, I can't believe that. I will say that I, I have seen the Northern Lights once when I was traveling in Alaska. And uh -huh. so it is amazing. But yeah. to see that picture behind you, to <laughs> see that, wow, that's, that's not what I was seeing. <laughs> Yeah, so to me, that was just one of the really spectacular sights that, that we could see from space. Wow. Well, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, being a woman in those early days of science and physics. And um, as you know, this year we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the right to vote, the 19th Amendment, for okay. granting women the right to vote. And... Um, and I know you also have been a champion for women. Um, so 
I read something about uh, a flag you took to space in 1999. Can you tell us a little more? Yeah, and this is the perfect year to talk about it. Um, and coincidentally, I was um, uh, selected by President Clinton to serve on a presidential commission in 1998 that was timed to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, uh, New York. And um, so I met with that commission over the next year or so and, you know, really learned a lot more about the whole, you know, road to suffrage um, than I uh, had known before. And uh, so I was flying in space the next year in 1999 and I was able to borrow a flag that was used by the National Women's Party 100 years ago as they were fighting for uh, women's suffrage and take it into space with me. And this was my third mission. And um, as this photo shows, uh, there were actually two other women on flight with me, uh, Julie Payette, who's actually a, a Canadian astronaut and she's currently the uh, Governor General of Canada and then also uh, Dr. Tammy Jernigan. And this was the only one of my four missions where there were other women on the flight. So mm -hmm. it was the perfect opportunity. And to me, um, uh, you know, it was a way that I could show the gratitude I had for all of those who fought for suffrage. And then of course there was a long road, as you know, even after 1920 to continue to get voting rights, um, especially for uh, women of color, um, and so really the civil rights movement, the equal rights movement for women, you know, all of that needed to happen for, for us to be able to um, be welcomed into the astronaut corps and have this opportunity to take this flag into space. So it's one of my, one of my favorite photos just because of what it represents. And with this year being the 100th anniversary, it's particularly appropriate to show this year. So where is that flag now? Um, so I borrowed it from the, um, at the time it was called the Sewell Belmont House, and now I believe it's called the um, Belmont Paul National Monument, so uh, in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah, I, I have been in that house, and I've, <laughs> next, time we're, next time we're able to travel, I might go look, look for it. It's, okay. it's, wow, that's uh, just knowing that you connected the history of that long ago movement to three women in space. It just, um, that's a beautiful picture. Um, <laughs> but you talked about the sort of civil rights movement and the uh, equal rights and everything. So I have this question. Um, I understand your grandparents immigrated from Mexico um, and my parents um, are from Mexico as well. Yeah. And so I ask, um, a, what part of Mexico did your grandparents come from? And, and B, um, that experience and whether you yourself um, experienced any sort of discrimination um, if, as you were growing up or even as an adult. Yeah, um, so my grandparents came from uh, the state of Sonora. I don't know exactly which town. Um, and they first, uh, after they got married, they had a few kids. They first went to Arizona and then to Southern California. And my dad was the youngest of 12. So uh, they lived in California when he was born. And, you know, I think one of the things that manifested it is certainly my dad and his brothers and sisters experienced that. And uh, when I was growing up, my dad really would not speak Spanish around the house, except maybe very little around the dining room table, you know, or, or something. And my mother, who is not Hispanic, was the one who kept trying to encourage him <laughs> to do that. Because I think she really saw the benefit of us being bilingual, not only because we could talk to our relatives, like my grandmother on that side um, never spoke English. So, um, you know, that was really the only way we could communicate her was in Spanish. But I think my mom just really saw the value in general of if you can speak two languages, you have a skill that other people don't have. But um, I, you know, I just wish uh, I had been able to grow up bilingual. It would have been so easy. In terms of my career, though, um, you know, as I mentioned, with that um, experience I had with the professor, and, and of course, there were a few other experiences like that. I mean, it's hard to know. Was, was it because I was a woman? Was it because I was Hispanic? Some combination? I mean, you know, people don't necessarily 
generally come out and say. So you don't really know exactly. Um, and I think a lot of times it's, um, it's a lack of encouragement or a lack of people telling you about opportunities. So you don't even know when you haven't had the same kinds of um, opportunities that other people had. Um, but I will say I was also lucky to have a lot of people who supported and encouraged me along the way. Uh, my mom, of course, but you know, uh, I think about um, particularly in graduate school, I had a couple of really great PhD advisors and you know, they supported me as well as, as any student. And, and I've talked to many women in the sciences and engineering who actually had very bad experiences with their mm -hmm. advisors. So I think actually over the years, I've become even more grateful um, to them for, uh, for their uh, encouragement of me. Um, my first supervisor at NASA when I was a research engineer, you know, really uh, pushed me to become a supervisor, pushed me to um, get more visibility within NASA, put me on an agency-wide team when I'd only been at NASA maybe less than a year, you know, really gave me opportunities like that. And so I had various people like that throughout my career. So, you know, for everyone who um, didn't think I fit their view of what a scientist or engineer should be, um, I also found people who supported me. Well, I, um, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, was it gender? Was it race? I always, um, I don't know if you know, but um, President Clinton was the first one who appointed a first, the first ever a female deputy chief of staff. Oh, okay. And um, that was Evelyn Lieberman and then Sylvia Matthews um, and then me. And I was the first person of color in that role. Okay. Um, and I always joke and say that um, if I were ever to write a book was it race and gender in the White House because you didn't know if you were being excluded because of race or gender. I think, I, I think gender had more to do with it, frankly, at this point. But it's an interesting comparison. But I also really struck by the, um, the language issue is, um, is one that I, a course I want to teach is the politics and policy of language in America. Because um, we've, we've really, the science now tells us that learning another language as a young person, as a young child, only benefits, you're connecting more neurons. Um, yes. And yet we still um, have, um, whether you're in California or New across the country, real problems educating our um, English language learners. And, um, and I think that that level of discrimination totally is understandable why your father would, you know, sort of want you only to speak English, didn't want you to feel. Um, but I'm hoping that because science now tells us that it's a good thing to know more than one language, that maybe we can um, create more bilingual programs, dual language immersion programs. Um, have you, excuse me? I agree, yes. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, talking about education, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that there is, um, there are questions about American children's performance on NAEP and, and you know, math and sciences right. and just really not being at the very top. You know, we're a little competitive, let's just face it. We, we, we think of ourselves as, right? So what do you think is, um, have you given any thought about why, what is going on in our education system? I mean, um, especially the teaching of math, um, which is so important for mm -hmm. the future economy, which is going to require higher skills than, um, than prior economy, industrial economy. Right. And, and uh, I think it's math. I think it's sort of anything having to do with technology, right? Coding, um, in, you know, lots of things that um, people will need to use in careers, even actually if they're not scientists or engineers, right? Because technology has become a part of so many other industries as well. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm not the educational expert, but I will say there is still, um, you know, people still have implicit biases about who are good at these subjects and who you should encourage, you know, to continue in these subjects. And so I think uh, women and other underrepresented minorities in science and engineering fields um, suffer from that, um, uh, certainly more than others. It, it seems very odd to me that our country is just very complacent about, you know, having 30 more countries in the world whose students score better on science and math than, than our students, particularly when it's clear it's so important to a thriving economy, to future innovation in this country. I mean, you know, I, I think there's a very clear link. And, um, you know, right now I'm the chair of the National Science Board. And one of the things that the National Science Foundation funds is, you know, how do you better teach math? How do you better teach science? And there is a lot of research on that. But I think education is so localized in this country that it's very hard to get that information out and to really have all these teachers across the country who can take advantage of this research and really try to uh, apply it in their schools. And, and we know there's, there's so many issues with, you know, teachers having to spend their own money just for basic supplies in their classrooms. So, uh, you know, I ha my hat's off to teachers, absolutely. And I know so many of them are doing an absolutely heroic job right now in trying to connect to their students virtually. Uh, but it is an area where we, we really, really need to do better. If you want to think about the U.S., you know, 10 years from now or more, you know, really being the leader in science and engineering and, and in generating new innovations, which lead to new industries. Uh, so true. So true. Um, there's a, there was a recent um, study by Deutsche Bank that looked at the tech divide, digital divide with some very startling, very concerning uh, projections. Uh, given the digital divide in Black and Latino communities, yeah. they estimated that um, by 2045, um, two thirds of African-American and 65% um, of Latinos would not have the skills for 86% of the jobs that would be the jobs of the future. So this okay. is, this is a real crisis. Um, it is. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm really glad to hear you're at the NSF and that you're. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll talk offline because that's this is really an important equity issue. Um, right. That that's not just about what's doing what's right, but it's also about our economic future. Right? It's about. But um, okay. I'm going to turn to. Uh, you know, you served as deputy director and then director of the Johnson Space Center. Now, those are management jobs, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. <laughs> and you were um, the second woman to take on that role. And um, I know, so I want to hear a little bit about um, being the the person in charge of mission control that we see in movies, you know, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so, what are some of the things that you had to deal with? Oh, exactly. Uh, well, it, it was, uh, I, I was really privileged to be in that position. We have about um, 10,000 people that work at Johnson Space Center, um, a little over, a little under 3,000 are government employees. And then the rest work for contractors who NASA um, works with to, to get all the work done. And of course, uh, Johnson Space Center is really the home of human spaceflight. So, you know, we have the astronauts, we have mission control, lots and lots of uh, engineers, um, a lot of uh, medical people because we're also responsible for human health and performance in space. And, um, and of course, we develop uh, new spacecraft as well. So, you know, all of that was uh, part of our mission. And uh, if, if we talk specifically about Mission Control Center and the people that support it, um, it's a group of people whose job we always talk about is plan, train, fly. So first you have to plan out the missions. What are the objectives, you know, and, and um, you may be working with various different customers who are um, sponsoring science experiments. And so you have to determine you know, how you're going to get all of those done and, and how you fit that in. 
And then of course you have to train not only the astronauts, but all the people who work in mission control because they have to be prepared um, to overcome all kinds of different um, problems that could go wrong. And, and then you actually, of course, execute the mission. And when we had shuttle flights, of course, a mission might last 10 or 15 days. And then you'd stand down for a while and you'd, you'd be doing training and then there would be another mission. Well, for the last 20 years, we've had people in space every minute of every day. Wow. So you never stand down. And so you are always, um, you know, simultaneously planning, training and flying and, you know, actually executing. And with the International Space Station, you know, there's five space agencies and they represent 15 countries that, um, that form this partnership. And so our mission control in Houston is really the coordinating control center for, for all of this. But they work closely with the control center in Moscow. And also there's one in Germany and one uh, a little bit outside Tokyo and one in Canada that specifically deals with the robot arm, which is uh, what Canada has provided. And so, uh, it, it has become very interesting in that, you know, not only are you achieving objectives, but you are trying to make sure that all your partners are achieving their objectives as well. And so you really have to work together as a team. So when you talk about um, building bridges, <laughs> uh, you know, that's exactly uh, what this team is doing, you know, every single day at Johnson Space Center with their counterparts around the world. And- um, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I, I guess another thing I was going to say is, of course, um, people see in the news that NASA works with uh, commercial partners in a different way than we used to, right? And so uh, when we just this summer had um, two astronauts who went to and from the space station on SpaceX's Crew Dragon, you know, what was different about that than what the way we used to do it is SpaceX owned that spacecraft and they were responsible for operating it and for the safety of our astronauts, you know, on the trip to the space station and then on the way home, um, you know, through their recovery. And so NASA again had to figure out, okay, here's another partner that we have to work with. And, um, and so they had, to, uh, NASA had to understand how do we actually certify this whole system that it's safe for our astronauts to go fly on when we don't have as much information about it as we're used to when it's a vehicle that we own and that we developed the, um, the very detailed requirements for. Uh, but uh, fortunately that flight went really well. I think um, SpaceX learned a lot from NASA and I think NASA learned um, from SpaceX with some different ideas and different ways of, of approaching it. So, it, you know, it's been a very, um, I, I would say a very innovative partnership uh, and then NASA is also working with Boeing and, and we hope to see their uh, test flight next year. I say we, even though I'm retired from NASA, but after 30 years, I, I can't help it. <laughs> you still feel connected. Um, I, I, I have to ask um, um, a qu question from the audience because how do you go from being an active participant, right, in a program, being astronaut, to a manager? and not just a manager, the manager, um, how do you change your mindset? Or did you have, like, did you have to? Well, I did. And I think it was especially a, a change uh, in my very first management job after leaving the astronaut office. Uh, my very first uh, commander, my first flight was a Marine. And he said, okay, Marines, we have two goals. Accomplish the mission, take care of your people. And um, so I always thought about that in every job that I have. Well, when you're a crew member on a space flight, it's very clear what your mission is. You know all the objectives of the flight, you know what you're responsible for. And so there's, there, you know, it's, it's just very well defined. When you become a manager of a group and then think, um, you know, all the way up to center director, you have to really um, change your idea of what accomplish the mission means. You really have to broaden that. And, um, you know, it took me a little while to figure out really how to say, you know, how to understand how am I contributing um, to this mission. But as center director, you have to think about kind of two aspects of the mission. Um, today's mission, meaning those things we're funded to do right now, operate the International Space Station, you know, develop the Orion spacecraft, 
um, develop some new technology for future exploration. And then tomorrow's mission, which you know is going to involve human space exploration, but you realize it's going to change. You know, you're going to have different partners, new technology, different procedures. And um, you have to think about what skills should we be hiring in, not the ones we need today, but the ones we're going to need 10 years from now. And so that was the interesting and more strategic part of, of you know, accomplishing the mission. And then when you think about taking care of your people, that you know, incorporates a whole lot of things that any um, head of any organization needs to think about. You know, how do we attract and retain um, the best people? And, and that, of course, gets into inclusion and making sure people feel respected and valued. And that was a, a huge uh, focus of mine. It's about training and development. It's about their health and safety and making sure they're working together as a team to, to move us forward. So there were so many different aspects of the job. Uh, and, um, you know, it was just a, a, a true privilege because there's so many talented people uh, at Johnson Space Center. And of course, uh, we worked with uh, people across different NASA centers. And as I mentioned, with commercial partners and international partners. So really a very large team, um, but really talented and all focused on this goal of advancing human spaceflight. And, you know, you don't always get to um, work in an organization where people are really all focused on this goal that's bigger than themselves and that really benefits people here on Earth. Oh, that's, uh, I felt that way about working in government, working for the president feeling like I was working on behalf of the American people and, uh, and public service is, um, it is a very high calling. So I, I get that sense. Yes, I'm sure you but, felt very much that same way. Yeah. Um, we have some que a question from several audience members. Um, they sound like uh, young women who ask, uh, what advice would you give young women who aspire to accomplish big things or, or who want to work for NASA? I mean, is there specific? And, and I think as you think about that, I'd like to ask also preview the, the final question that we always ask of the bridge builders, which is what is your call to action for all those watching tonight? Okay, well, let's see. First, I think what I would tell uh, especially young women who, who want to accomplish big things. First of all, we need you. <laughs> you know, we need your curiosity, your creativity, um, your hard work, your intellect, you know, all these things that are really part of you. Um, and um, oftentimes people don't give, uh, give young women or uh, other people credit for really being able to contribute. So I hope you'll think about um, studying math and science too, or you may have other ideas of what you want to accomplish, but there's so much opportunity to make new discoveries and solve challenges that face our communities and our planet. So um, beyond that, I would say persevere. Um, you know, anything worth doing is going to be hard. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you just have to take it day by day, step by step. As I said, find the people who support and encourage you. And realize that those that don't generally don't know anything about you. Um, and they're just, you know, kind of going off preconceived notions of who they think can accomplish things. Um, look for opportunities, like for NASA. If you're in college, uh, we have a great internship program called the Pathways Internship Program. You can actually work in a NASA center and get paid for it. Um, and uh, it's a great um, entree to NASA or to um, space exploration in general. And then, you know, one thing that I wish I had realized earlier was really at any stage of your life, you can be a leader. And so sometimes I, I talk about this quote that is generally attributed to John Quincy Adams that says, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Hmm. And you know, I had this um, idea in my life that you really had to rise to a position with a title before you could be a leader. And I now often run into you know, college students who have started nonprofits or who mentor high school students or high school students who mentor middle school students. They are, they are leaders. And uh, so it's something really that people of any age can do. 
And so uh, for my call to action, um, I thought I'd start out with a fun thing, which is uh, watch the International Space Station fly over the Earth. And um, for those who are in Arkansas, there's a great um, flyover opportunity on Thursday evening at 7.38 p.m. It'll be visible for five minutes. It's hard to miss as long as it, you know, the sky isn't completely cloud covered because it's very bright and it's traveling faster than anything else in the sky. And all you need to do is just um, on a search on the computer, uh, put in spot the station. And that will take you to a website that NASA has where you just put it in whatever city you're in and it will show you, um, uh, tell you when the flyovers occur and, and where to look. So I would say that would be step one. And then think about what interests you most about that experience. Maybe you wanna learn more about astronomy. Maybe you wanna learn about the science that's going on on the space station. And again, there's a great website that NASA has on ISS research and um, how it's being applied on Earth. Um, you may wanna go more into the international aspects. There's two launches this month um, on October 14th. One of our NASA astronauts, Kate Rubens, um, is launching with two cosmonauts from Kazakhstan on a Russian vehicle. And then later in the month, we have four astronauts who will be launching again on a SpaceX Crew Dragon. And it's a really diverse, interesting crew. Uh, we have a Japanese astronaut and we have three NASA astronauts including uh, one woman and one black astronaut. And so I think it really represents um, the diversity within the astronaut corps and within NASA in general. And I hope in addition to just them being incredibly talented um, that they will be able to reach out to lots of people. That sounds great. Well, I, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed having a chance to, to learn more about your career and your life and um, the work that you do, but I'm going to turn it over to um, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin Thurman, take it away. That was great. It was it was it was just great. Uh, Dr. Joa uh, Maria, thank you for joining us tonight as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. Thanks for a truly inspirational conversation. Really, really terrific. A special thanks. Uh, to Beth and Mike Colson and Colson Oil, our sponsoring bridge builder for sponsoring our bridge builder conversation. Um, without their support, conversations like this would not be possible. I hope you'll plan to join us uh, for the next virtual bridge builders program on October 19th. Uh, I will be back to moderate a conversation with my former colleague, Dr. David Thatcher author of the new book, My Quest for Health Equity, Notes on Learning While Leading. Dr. Satcher is a lifelong leader for civil rights and health equity. We uh, worked together during uh, the Clinton administration at the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Satcher served as the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from 1993 to 1998, and then as Surgeon General of the United States during end of the Clinton administration and during the George W. Bush administration. You can register for that program and see all of the Clinton Center's upcoming programs by visiting www.clintonpresidentialcenter.org slash events. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Stay healthy, take good care, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks again.